So I have this teacher that I'm mentoring and she would, she'd text me and it's like, oh, you know, she was like, what do I do with this? How do I fix this? A lot of it's trial and error, you know, cause you can't, you can't possibly cover how to fix everything on every instrument. It's just, it's just impossible. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the good fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Jake Walker and Colin Peters for their contributions to the show, and especially to all of you who are listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, Mary Cogswell. Hi, Mary. Hey, Mark. So, Mary, we've uh, actually just first met at Midwest. I've known of you, but uh, we hadn't met until this December. And I'm really excited to have you on the show. You are, I, well, I should let you introduce yourself. Will you uh, tell the listeners about yourself, who you are? Sure. My name is Mary Cogswell, and I am the beginning band director at Camelot Intermediate School in Brookings, South Dakota. Excellent. And you have a few other things on your uh, curriculum, Vita. <laughs> if you, so you are the current president of the South Dakota Bandmasters Association? Correct. I am just going into my second year of two. So Mary, can you, um, can you tell us your origin story? How did you get into music? Sure. I started taking piano lessons when I was in third grade and uh, continued with that actually all the way through college. And then fifth grade came around and had the opportunity to join band. And fortunately for me, I had very uh, patient and supportive parents that allowed me to try all sorts of activities. Um, I think early on figuring out athletics was probably not going to be my forte. So they allowed me to start band and I chose the clarinet for what reason I don't know. I have no idea why I chose the clarinet. Um, and so I got started on that. And when I had started piano lessons, the deal was my parents would do the dishes after we had been, were done eating supper. And, and then I would practice my piano in the, in the living room right next to the kitchen. Uh, and then when I started clarinet, we didn't have a deal like that. And so I was, uh, not as, as diligent on the clarinet as I was on the piano, but I, I stuck with it and went into uh, middle school and somewhere along the way in middle school, something clicked. I don't remember what that was, uh, but just gained more interest. And I started taking lessons from my then junior high band director in the summers and obviously started to get better uh, and kept with it. And then uh, when it was the year before my high school year, which in this case was ninth grade, they were still on the junior high system at that time. Uh, a friend of mine whose brother was in the high school band that I was going to go to invited me to their indoor marching band concert, which is kind of a concept in this area. I don't know how much uh, it is other in other areas of the country, but invited me to go to this concert. So I went and I think from the first note, I was sold. That was one of those kind of life-changing moments where this was something that even in my ninth grade mind, I could tell this was really good. Um, this was cool. This was something I wanted to be a part of. And so that, that's kind of how that, my start was in, in music and in band. And uh, yeah, continued through both, uh, all the way through high school and college. Uh, so yeah, both had huge impacts on me. 
Mm -hmm. So that winter indoor um, marching activity, that was something that I never experienced as a kid. Is, is, did it start in sort of the upper Midwest? Well, it's not, um, it's not like the winter drumline or winter guard. It's just at the conclusion of the regular marching band season. So in South Dakota, it's towards the end of October. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an indoor marching band concert. And so they take oh, their show music and, and then a few other probably pep tunes or whatever and transfer it into an auditorium setting. And so the band marches into the aisles and then onto the stage, et cetera. Um, and in, in Brookings, we do it a little differently. We do it in the gym and they actually do a really, really, really condensed version of their show sure. on, on the gym floor. And so that was the indoor marching band concert that I was just, I was sold on, sold on band. And so was, when do you think the moment was that you decided, you know, I'm going to go and do this as a profession. Was that at that moment? No, I don't think so. Uh, all the way through, I, it, for, I guess, South Dakota terms, I was a, a pretty good pianist. And so went into college being a piano major and then on playing clarinet as well in the band. Uh, but then I think the moment I decided band is what I want to do, I, I was when it was when I was student teaching and I just loved it. And I, I, part of it, of course, were the kids. And I had a wonderful uh, supervisor, student teacher supervisor that um, really helped and guided me. And it was after that, that I thought, I, this is what, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm more comfortable doing. Um, I just have really enjoyed it. And so that's, that was the moment I would not tell, I was, I think I always knew I was going to be a teacher. Not until I student taught did I figure out what I was going to be a teacher of. It's really interesting because you say that you were in student teaching, which means you had done your music ed degree, which you knew yep. you were going to be some kind of music teacher. Right. Uh, what were your other options if it wasn't band? Were you choir or? Uh, no, piano. And I knew I, um, not performance, I knew I wasn't of that caliber, but, you know, I thought maybe a piano pedagogy type of, of degree um, which those are around, but, um, I, yeah, when I started to te student teaching, that was the moment I just knew that's what I wanted to do. So now did you take clarinet lessons in college or was it mostly just piano? Yes. No, I started, like I said, I started taking clarinet lessons when I was in junior high and then, yep. And then I took lessons. I then started taking from a university professor, uh, in high school, and, and, and then also in college as well and, and was in band all the way through college and, of course, had that usual band community. That's, you know, that, that was your group of friends. And, um, you know, obviously, I'm still friends with those those people today. And yeah, so that, it really had that culture and that community. Yeah. Where'd you go to college? I went to college at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. It's a small liberal arts uh, college. There are several uh, very similar in the probably two or three state region um, that are very uh, steeped in in music. I think they say a third of their campus population is involved in music, not necessarily music majors, but are involved in some music ensemble. So, yeah, that's really interesting that it wasn't until you were a student teacher that really strikes me as being. So do you remember, I know we've taught, you said that you were inspired by it, but do you remember anything specific about that experience? Was there one thing that really kind of caught you or was it just the overall? I think just the overall, uh, I believe the, the student teacher that was immediately before me probably didn't have such a good experience. And I knew that going in. And so I, I was really prepared. And, you know, my supervisor had told me, so it might take a little bit for the students to warm up to you um, because of their past experience. And I think I really took that to heart and probably tried extra hard. Uh, not that I wasn't going to try hard, but I think I tried extra hard. And I, I don't think there was a specific moment. I just think gradually as a semester went along, I just really enjoyed it and thought, oh, this, this is my place. So your student teaching was in a junior high or a high school? 
Yes, yes, yes. It was in a junior high. And have you ever taught high school, Mary? I'm just asking. I have. I, my very first job was a 5 through 12 job in a small district in southeast South Dakota. What I know you as is like middle school beginner band extraordinaire. Yep. And uh, that's kind of what your reputation is. And, and I think that's where the focus of our conversation will be. Um, so after you finished that student teaching, was that your first job, that 5 through 12? Correct. How long were you there? Four years. So how did you negotiate that? Because I know there's a lot of young teachers in particular who start in positions like that. Mm -hmm. how, how, what advice would you have for a young <laughs> teacher? <laughs> and some people do K through 12, I know. I know. And there is a lot of that in South Dakota, definitely. Um, that first year especially was an eye-opening experience. I learned a lot about myself and I learned about a lot about being a band director. I learned a lot about what I didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, it, so I, it is, and then it's, it's an eye opening experience. And I think for those that are going into that, like I said, we have lots of five through 12 in South Dakota and we have a lot of K through 12, everything. Um, and those, people are true heroes because that's just, I can't imagine the amount of prep that goes into all of that. Uh, but I think you have to go in knowing you don't know everything and seek advice, find people that will answer, that will help you. And there is, as you, you know, we say that to our students, there is no stupid question, you know, but please ask and don't just assume that you know so that, that would be my best advice. Find a mentor. Yeah, that, that mentorship piece is really crucial um, for young directors. Fortunately, we live in an era where we have the internet at our fingertips and we have things like podcasts that people can listen to. I know Absolutely. when I left college teaching to go into uh, – back to the elementary school, I know that I was uh, listening to a lot of Darcy stuff and, you know, it's just, it was, it was so nice to kind of like be in her classroom on a podcast just to remember, be like, okay, yeah, okay. I remember this. I can do this. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that the, we, there's a lot of resources. When I started, it was basically, I, I, there was a director in the district who took me under his wing and that's the only reason I probably made it through the first year. Yeah. I'm with you. The, the choral director that uh, was in the system with me also same, same thing. She, you know, was a wonderful mentor and was I really patient. So uh, I was always very fortunate that she was around for me. Yeah. It's, it, I was stubbornly proud at that point where I thought I knew everything. <laughs> I, I think that's not uncommon. Isn't it funny that when we know our least, that's when we actually think we know the most, I guess that's yeah. well known. That's what the sophomore means wise fool, you know, a little bit, which means, you know, nothing. <laughs> that would be correct. Yeah. And, and even now, you know, I learn something new every day. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So that first job, did you follow a well-known teacher? Was he, was he or she well-established? Probably the opposite of that. Okay. Okay. And, and so in many ways, in some ways that's good. Mm -hmm. Sure. And in some ways, it's not good. So the, the numbers were low when I came in. So that was the downside to it. But um, I had that, that area to bring it back up and, and get student buy-in. So in that respect, that was a good thing. Yeah, I think it's that idea of, you know, if you start at the top, there's only one way to go. If you start yeah. at the bottom, you know, you have only one way to go and it's a better way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When you follow somebody that's well liked and has done a great job, that that would be really challenging. Yeah. We talk about that from time to time, you know, every now and then I'll get someone on the show and often they're exceptional themselves. And so they were able just to transition. Right. But I know that a lot of uh, young teachers, especially when they're thrown into that situation, can struggle because, you know, my first year of teaching, I know it took me a while to win over the seniors. It took, you know, it wasn't like they liked me at first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very common. Yeah, you 
sad to say, but you have to get the seniors out and then you, you can at least start developing those relationships yeah. with the younger students. Especially if they had a well-liked and a successful yes. director. Right. In my situation, um, there was only a part-time person who wasn't doing a lot. So it, I actually won them over mid-year because they were like, oh, okay. wait a minute, he's here every day and doing this. And, you know, it was kind of like I was I it, the system was set up for me to succeed, I guess is what I was saying. Yeah, but I know it is a struggle. I, I'm actually mentoring a, a teacher right now. And yeah, some of those things we just said are just right on. That's exactly what some of the struggles are. Yeah, and you don't want to change too much. But the, by the same token, nope. you don't want to let bad habits persist. So there's a balance right. there. Yep, you're um, right. That's tough. It is tough. And it's a fine line. And, and it's unfortunate. You know, I in some ways, I've God, I've had so many of these interviews. I've talked through so many of these issues in different ways. You know, I'm in I'm in Southern Illinois, and the the district where I'm in, there's multiple band directors in the programs. But it doesn't take far, 20, 30 miles east, and we're into rural farmland, where there's one director, like you said, in the school. And my first job was one director. So when I showed up, there was no other band director to help me. And I, I that. That idea, I like what I like about Texas is that, you know, when you go in, you start as like the third assistant. <laughs> and so you work right, well, right right. Up, up the ranks. Um, and so, you know, in the situation opposite of that, it's really important to reach out. So how, what kind of advice would you give to a, a young teacher about finding a mentor? Let's say they're struggling and um, they need to find someone. Well, our state, actually, our state department of education has a mentor program set up. So we can direct them that way. And obviously, if they know a South Dakota Bandmaster member, obviously, we would help them and also direct them actually to, to the Department of Education mentor uh, program. It's, it's really a great program. The mentor, you actually get paid. You get your next teaching certificate renewed. And the same for the mentee doesn't get paid, but they get their uh, next teaching certificate taken care of. Um, so, and, and there are obvious requirements that go along with this, but um, that would be what I would highly suggest doing. Or, you know, if you're uncomfortable with that, if you're in a small district, you know, reach out to the band director in the district next to yours, or, you know, reach out to somebody um, or like your state associations. Uh, we knew this past year uh, we had so many openings. I mean, it's, it's really scary and it's the trend has already started now for next year. And so we started, South Dakota Bandmasters actually started, it's called Live from the Band Room. And it's, um, we started out the school year once a month where we just met on Zoom and had topics and deadlines coming up. You know, this festival is coming up, this deadline, you need to register. That type of information was given out and just, you know, well, this happened, what do I do? Things like that. So um, we've set up something like that to also try and help those first year teachers out. So if they have any questions and then hopefully they get to just, it's a networking thing too. You, you get to know each other and then, you can read if you feel comfortable, you can reach out to one of those. So, yeah. And I, I can pretty much guarantee that if anyone needs a mentor and you're listening, you can reach out to me. I can probably find someone in your area at this point. I've talked to so many people. Exactly. And if not, I can probably find someone who will know someone who will know someone that will, because right. it, in the end, we're teachers, whether it's of our fifth graders, sixth graders, 12th graders, or of the younger teachers, you know, we want, we're trying to make the world a better place. Ultimately, at least that's why I assume most of us got into this field. So. Absolutely. And I, I would say in the band community, we are very willing to share information and resources and we're, we're just willing to share to, to help each other out and, and the students. That's why we're here. So. All right, Mary, one of the things I was thinking, you mentioned those videos, one of the projects I'd like to do in all my spare time is, um, is create a series of like beginning instrument videos, like, you know, for new, for young teachers, like, you know, here's from a master teacher, here's from Mary Cogswell talking about how to start a clarinet player, you know, sure. and, uh, to kind of go through those basic steps, you know, it's like, what do you do? I taught fifth grade beginners today. They've been playing for 
five weeks maybe. And so, you know, I have a saxophone player. He sounds like a buzzsaw. So do you know how mm-hmm. to fix that? <laughs> you know, those kinds of things, those kinds of questions. Right. And, exactly. Uh, you know, so that's, that's something that I think would be useful, but, um, again, it's a project. Another, yeah. Another well, I, I started doing that several years ago. Um, I'd have a, a, a student move into our district and wanted to play whatever instrument. And, yeah. you know, so I, I could get with the student not as much time as I needed. And so I would make these videos and I would, and then I would say, okay, but now here's a link that's on my website. You can go home and watch this video. If you forget which two parts of the clarinet go together, here's a video that will step you through that. I was thinking more pedagogically based, like directed at teachers, you know, the, the, the inside baseball that we don't want the kids to necessarily. Right. You know, you know, you don't, yeah. don't I've really... started a document with, with information on it like that, but I haven't done a video on that yet. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so funny. I, I'm, actually just revisiting the inner game of tennis. I don't know if you know this book, the Timothy Gall no, inner not. game of tennis. It's from, I think the early seventies. Um, and basically it's about letting go of the details so you can focus on the product. You know, it's yep. like when you think about how to hit a tennis ball, very often you're going to hit the frame and the ball is going to go flying off. <laughs> But, you know, it's right. the same thing with instrumental music. You know, sometimes you can give too much information to a beginner and they become paralyzed and they can no longer do anything. Yes, I completely agree with that. It's 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 information overload at first for them. Yeah. And so you don't necessarily want the students to know all this stuff, you know? No, it's totally um, true. Yeah. So let's talk about teaching beginners. And, um, I know that's a passion of yours and it's something that I'm doing right now. I really enjoy it. Um, and then there are times when I don't enjoy it, you know, (laughs) so it's got its unique challenges. Um, let's start from the broad and let's maybe narrow our way in a little bit because it's hard to know what questions that listeners are going to want me to ask you. So let's just start from the the big picture. How do you start your classes? What's your sort of basic philosophy towards be- starting beginners? From from them picking out an yeah. instrument? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um my philosophy is I want them to pick the instrument that they want to play. Um that's the one that they hopefully really want to play and they will practice. Uh, I, unless it's a, a real significant, obvious, you know, issue that you can see with their lips or teeth or mouth, um, you know, I, if that's the case, we'll try and guide them in a certain direction. But otherwise, I really try and let them play the instrument that they want to play in hopes that they pick it and, and practice it. I, many years I've had parents come in and say, oh, my band director forced me to play the whatever instrument and, and I hated every minute of it. And it's like, well, I want to try and try and avoid that. Um, but we do, I allow them to try two choices. Um, and so at least they have the opportunity to try two different mouthpieces. And so they, at least can have an idea that they can produce a sound might not be lovely, but, um, and, and I always make sure, cause they always ask me, well, why do I have to pick two? I'm like, well, just on the off chance that maybe the first one just doesn't work for you and how your, your, you know, lips and teeth are, we will try the second one and, and, and then hopefully one of those will work out best for you. So. But I, I, I really, yeah, I try and let them pick the one they want to play. So what would you say to the person who's listening going, but I would end up with 12 saxophones and five drummers? Yep. And and some some years I do. Uh, and oh, yeah. And so I just let them start. And eventually, hopefully you can try and convince them, you know, if you have, again, you know, 20 saxophones, you can eventually get some of them to st- get on tenor, get on berry. You know, maybe some would be interested in moving over to clarinet. Um, and the same thing, I always have lots of trumpet players. So, um, you know, let them start on trumpet. And um, and some of them, you can tell, it's like, oh, that bigger mouthpiece is 
probably going to work better for you. And then you can guide them that way too. Yeah. But, I was just um, about to ask you, I was kind of leading into the next question is, you know, here are the, here's the two things that always happen as you know, how do you deal with the students who they need to switch for whatever physical reason? And we see that we know this. Um, sure. and then how do you deal with the kid who, as soon as it gets difficult, it, they want to switch? Uh, that's tough. You know, and, and they haven't put any effort into it. And, and we usually have that conversation. So you want to switch, but okay. So give me a, an estimate about how many times have you practiced your instrument at home? Um, well, they usually can't answer that. And it's like, well, I'll tell you what, let's set up a practice schedule and we'll get you actually practicing on a consistent basis and then we can talk. And a lot of times that fixes it. Yeah, because as soon as they become better at the instrument, they suddenly start to like it, as we know. Right. That's weird how that works. Do you have any specific tips for the younger students, fourth and fifth graders, as far as dealing with them as beginners? I know we have to go a little bit slower. Um, any sort of thoughts about that? Um, review a lot. Yeah, go slower. Go back and review a lot. Uh, so what does that look like for you, Mary? As far as a daily? Yeah. Like, I mean, if you were sort of thinking about day to day, how would you incorporate that review into your lessons? Um, well, right now I'm, I use a lot of the John McAllister videos. I don't know if you're familiar with those. And it's, those are great for just getting the kids started. So they come in the room and unfortunately, they come in the room in a trickle. And so they put their instrument together, but they just jump in. So I start the, the video and they have the music in front of them. And so you, as soon as you have your instrument put together, you jump in. And so that's, that's the first review. So I'll stay on one of those videos for a number of weeks. So then it, we're always just at least getting that review to start with. And then it's just a matter of at the beginning of the year, we'll go back and we'll play different lines out of the, the method book earlier on. And, and now, you know, we're, we're going through the B-flat concert scale and um, in their lessons, we're going through note naming. If I know one of the students is really still struggling with figuring out which note is which, which you know how that goes. So we'll play, I know, which is amazing to me, but so we'll play some, some video game um, Staff Wars or Music Racer to help that. And, you know, we're writing and counting and stuff like that now. So it's just, you just, it's easy to build that in. Do you do that like on a smart board for the whole class? Yeah. So the, I just recently found this one, um, Rhythm Randomizer. Yes, that one's awesome. And you can pick the, the note durations that you want and then oh. it'll yeah and then it'll flip through new rhythms and you can add what it you know it's a digitized sound what it would sound like and that you can add a metronome to it and then i have a promethean board and that you can annotate so you can pop up the yeah the rhythm and then the kids can write the counting in underneath it's great yeah, I just got my first smart board this year. I had I got the we the school got a grant for the new ones, you know, the the big 75 inch digital ones. And right. so I got one of the older ones, but I'm gonna get a digital one next year. So I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. Because they're a lot more flexible, the things you can do. Yes. Um Absolutely. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I haven't thought to use my smart board kind of interactively like that. I've been using it to put up counting exercises, you know, lines that I want them to read that aren't in their method book, things like that. Um, sure. Um, I, I always start with Darcy's rhythm book. And sure. so I, you know, I have the metronome clicking when they come in and then I give them two or three minutes to get in and, you know, start setting up and then I'll start counting lines and then they have to jump in. And then once everyone's counting and have done a few lines then I'll start class, that's kind of how I do it. Um, but right. I like the idea of the McAllister videos. I hadn't thought about that either. This is why we have these conversations. Exactly. <laughs> we all learn from each other. We started doing also, I always have the kids learn how to conduct in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in 10-year-old terms, 4-4. Mm -hmm. oh, obviously, yeah. that's, that's as complicated as we get. But um, so it, it was actually a, a workshop that I went to that Robert Ambrose was here in, in Brookings for our South Dakota Bandmasters Conference about just 
students and having the the job be theirs to keep the pulse. And now I can, we got it down. So this is how you do this in elementary level. And you can use the Google uh, Chrome Music Lab. And, and then I also just discovered Groove Pizza is also very yes, good. My students know Groove Pizza. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, COVID. Yeah. So, you know, that, that gets them, you can get them conducting and at least feeling that beat more so than just tapping their toe. So you mentioned elementary school conducting. I have kind of an idea of what you mean, but you're, are you teaching them the pattern or are you just teaching them? The yes. Toe? Okay. So you're teaching them down, left, right, up, you know, that. Yep. Way. Yep. All right. All right. Um, yep. And then once we, you know, once we've done it, a few rehearsals, then I'll ask for volunteers. Okay. Who wants to come up and, and conduct the B flat concert scale? And I'll help you get started. Well, and, and the kids don't really watch you anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, they don't. I, um, <laughs> so we're just starting. Cause like I said, we started in January and I am right. a very big, um, sound to sight person. And so this is, we've just started the method book this week. I mean, we're just sure. in it now and, you know, sure enough, the percussionists in the back are just off to the races. They don't really care <laughs> about what the metronome's doing or what I'm doing. Nope. And so you're stopping. You're like, yo, it's uh, look up. Uh, <laughs> yep. Had that happen today. Yeah. So let me ask, let me think of what are some of the more common beginner issues. So my saxophones who sound like buzz saws, what do you tell them? How, what's, I well, guess I'm more after like the language of how you teach them, not the specifics. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, you know, especially for saxophones, they probably don't have their neck strap pulled up high enough <laughs> and they don't know how to do that. How'd you guess? <laughs> uh, it's happened a couple times. Um, they, you know, I always, what I tell everybody, it's like, before you do anything, check their read because so often there are chunks out of the top of it and they, you know, and, and you can tell them, all the time. Okay, so the, see this read, this is what your read should look like. If it doesn't look like this, get rid of it. But they don't, they don't piece that together. Uh, so I'll check the read first, and then check how far the mouthpiece, how much mouthpiece do they have in their mouth? Check the ligature. You know, they probably they might have it upside down and backwards for all. You know, I mean, I've seen it before. Or half check on where the neck they didn't gets. loosen it enough. That's one of my favorites. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, but I can't get it on any farther. Loosen the screws and then push it down. Anyway, that, I mean, that's interesting because you're you're already kind of hitting up. You're showing sort of like your experience because, you know, that neck strap thing. So let me ask you a very specific a question. As an older male band director, I'm very uncomfortable helping the kids fix their neck straps. How do you address that? Yeah, I, I just, you know, do you have them? Take I have the saxophone this, one off. I usually take the saxophone just off the strap. The strap is still on there around them, but you know, oftentimes I also have, so I'll get a saxophone strap and then I'll show them specifically. Okay. So I'm going to grab these two straps and now I'm going to pull up on the buckle. Right. So you do that now. And it, it takes a few tries, but sure. Yeah. I mean, it's always something because, you know, you're in the heat of the moment. You're trying to teach quickly and you're trying to deal yep. with all kinds of fires. And yep. the last thing you want to do is to stop everything to be like, okay, here's how you do your next strap. But sometimes yep. that's, and I'll give this advice. If you have more than one saxophone, do it for all of them at once. Yes. Don't just make it one because you're probably going to have to repeat the lesson for someone else. So Every time. That's my And more than once. <laughs> yes, definitely more than once. And then, they, then, then, so then they're done. You're done with rehearsal or their lesson. And then they try to take the neck strap off their head without loosening it. Have you had that experience? <laughs> it's like, well, no, that's not going to work. You, you're, or, yeah. you, now you have to pull down on the buckle. Yeah, or they try to put the saxophone away with the neck strap still on. That's a fun one, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, keeping the reed on the mouthpiece, you know, do you know how much mold is going to grow underneath that if you do that? I don't let them do that. I watch them pack up. Oh, no, I don't either. Yeah. But w sometimes they'll come to school when they've practiced it and I'm like, uh, why is your reed on your mouthpiece? Oh, I was in a hurry when I put it away. I don't care. <laughs> it's got to come off. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, that happened in my middle school. This when we started with the middle schoolers, they hadn't played since like at home April two years ago, yeah. and my clarinet player came with the reed still on the instrument, and I was like, oh, "That's gross." Ew. <laughs> you know, so it's like ew ew. Take this to the bathroom, wash it out, then take this alcohol. Yep. <laughs> you know, lots of that. So it, it's it's interesting for me to talk to you about these sorts of nuts and bolts because it gets at the heart of what makes a good began beginning band teacher. It's sort of these experiences and the ability to problem solve on the spot with really young minds. I mean, they're they're not well Absolutely. developed as far as their you know problem solving as we mentioned. No. So I guess what I want to take it from there is um, sort of the culture of the band. I mentioned when we first got on the the call today that I had a, an amazing middle school band rehearsal today. I had kids who were laughing so hard at themselves and at the whole situation that they were crying. It was just one of those days where it was like, that's why we do band. Right. How do we do that as teachers without ruining the whole thing? Because I know there's an art to it. Absolutely. Um, part of it is the school culture, which obviously you can only control so much of, which is very little. Um, so it, that's the start of it. And then I think it's just the, the culture that you set from the first day. And I think you can do that right away in beginning band. You know, we talked about, you know, lots of people talk about band, the band room was their home. And, you know, I try to actually start that in fifth grade where once we get started, um, so if you would like to come into the band room at lunch and practice or play your instrument with your friends, you're welcome to do that. I did do some, I am still doing some bucket drumming at lunch um, to just kind of, again, get back into that habit because I couldn't do it at all last year and just get that culture of the kids coming into the band room with their friends, having fun, um, even if it's bucket drumming, which can, you know, be kind of annoying at some times, but they're still have, I know, shocking, but they, they're still having fun. And, and now we, we just had a five through 12 district concert. And before that concert, the, the switch started to happen where, can we come in and play our instruments? Yes. I would love for you to do that. And so it's just, I think, giving those opportunities to the students to know that the band room is a safe place. It's a place to have fun. They can hang out with their friends. And along the way, they'll have fun and learn something. And I think that's just, you know, that there are multiple ways of which you can achieve that goal. Even in beginning band, I have kids that come in right now and they do a staff war. They're doing kind of a Star Wars staff war tournament. So they keep record up on the whiteboard of how many points everybody has. And that's just that culture that you can really start at a young age. And then hopefully that carries with them all the way through. You know, it's really interesting that you say that because I just, as you were saying that, I, my classroom is right next to the playground where they, you know, have lunch and after lunch go. Right. And, um, I have fifth grade bands scheduled during middle school lunch. And I think next year I'm going to request to have that block open. If you can get those kids, however, bought into the program, you know, however you achieve that, you're going to have some or fewer possible discipline issues like what we were talking about previously. And that's not going to solve every problem, obviously, but you know, it can, it will certainly help. And they can, then they can get their friends on board, you know, you know, Timmy over here is acting out in band class. And then if his friend has buy-in, you know, the friend will eventually stop it. Yeah. And you know what? It, it, my, my problems are always with the first year students because they don't have that buy-in yet. By the time to get to middle school, I've had them sure. for a few years and they know me, they understand me, they know the rules. We do fine. Right. And I'm able to be more myself with them, which in turn leads them to be more respectful and more all those things Correct. come because- there's nothing worse than a teacher, and a lot of young teachers do this. There's nothing wrong with trying on different faces, but you have to be genuine to yourself. You can't try to be someone else. You can only be you because the kids see through it. 
Oh, absolutely. So you just have to cultivate what the what the classroom you is, if that makes sense. Right. And, and, and sometimes, you know, depending on how much contact time you have with the students, sometimes that takes a while. You know, I don't see my kids every day, so it takes me longer than the classroom teachers, obviously. So yeah, and there's no question. I I only see my kids twice a week. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a long stretch to get from, you know, the first couple notes to any type of song. It's absolutely so. Oh, yes, absolutely. (sighs) Yeah. So Mary, let's talk about the flex band beginning band series you're doing with Robert Ambrose, another guest on this show. Um, yes. I know that's a big project of yours. So let's get into that before it gets any later in the episode. Sure. Uh, so a little bit how it came about. So it's the beginning band adaptable series, uh, through Murphy music press. And it started off, uh, last year during COVID year, And Robert and I were on the North American Band Survey Committee together. And so in developing the survey that we were going to send out, you know, we were developing the questions. And, of course, Flex Music came up as, you know, this is a great resource and opportunity during these you know, unusual and uncertain times. And, and Robert was associated with the Creative Repertoire Initiative. So he had already been doing a lot with composers and flex arrangements. And so we would meet and every time, you know, something else, I'd see it on a website or, or social media that, oh, now this tune has a flex version of it. And and I would get frustrated every single time because I'm like, well, what, what about us? What about us that do beginning band? There was like precious little. There were a few, but hardly any. And so obviously Robert could sense my frustration. And so one Saturday morning in January of, of 21, he called me up and he said, so Mary, um, do, you, do you know Murphy Music Press? You know, I'm very naive. And I said, well, I... I know of it. I see the booth when I go to Midwest, but that's, you know, the, so not really. And he said, well, he said, I, I've talked to Sean Murphy and um, I posed this question if he would be willing to house a series, a beginning band flex series on with Murphy Music Press. And we would be the co-editors. We're not going to get paid for it. This is We're doing this as a service to the profession. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, Sure, I would love to. And he said, I have, you know, composer friends, and you know, beginning band. So let's pool our resources. And so that's that's how it started. And uh, then we cultivated a criteria sheet of exactly what we wanted. It's very beginning, whole half quarter notes, very limited, repeated eighth notes. Um, it's uh, obviously flex, but the other main objective was kind of to have a bridge between the book, the method book, and your first, air quote, real tune. Uh, because especially last year, in in my situation and many uh, directors, I didn't know what my situation was going to be. I didn't know if I was going to get to see the kids as an ensemble or what the situation was going to be, or if I could, I was only going to get to see one group of students at a time. And so then one class, then I might have, you know, a flute and a tuba and eight percussionists. So um, that was kind of how the whole series started. And then we we had a first Zoom with those first five composers and, and we joked about it. And Robert's like, well, if they're all still on the call at the end of this, then we didn't completely scare them off with <laughs> the criteria for this series. And they were great. The composers were really great. And uh, the very first piece that came in was uh, Street Noise by Kataj Copley. And the first time I heard it, I thought, this is what we need. The, the beginning band community needs this. I need this as a director and the students need this. It's um, unlike your your typical 60 measure beginning band piece. And I have great things to say about those pieces. I have a whole file cabinet full of them, uh, but we needed a, an, another alternative. And this ter- has turned out to be a very good alternative. Um, so it's been very, it's very fun to see how it's grown and we're working on getting uh, educational material that's associated with 
all or most of the pieces. And the pieces that I have used with my own students, I think there is also, there's another, there's a buy-in more on that. How does band relate to their real world? That's a, that's a, a big buy-in. And, and I, I can already sense that from the tunes that I've played. And we played one of the tunes last year for the fourth graders. And one of my students now, they're like, oh, that's the one that had the videos with it, right? And I was like, yeah, you remember that. So there is there is a connection there. So I think there are some just interesting concepts that um, will continue to come from this series. And it's been a lot of fun to work with, with Robert and the composers. So Yeah, it's it's funny that you bring this up because at Midwest, um, I'm published by Robert W. Smith, and so is Heather Hopeful, who's sort of been a beginning band director for her whole career. And she's written yep. a couple of very popular pieces. Yes. Alpha Dog in particular. Yep. And um, her, her and I have been talking and we actually submitted a proposal for a clinic at Midwest about choosing exactly that, those bridge pieces from the method book to the sheet music, because there's precious few that are really appropriate. Agreed. So, so I do you have a couple that you would recommend for the listeners that sort of early bridge. I know you mentioned the cut the um, Taj Copley piece. Yeah, there's Kataj Copley's piece, uh, Jennifer Rose's In the Distance. Mm -hmm. um, I played that with my students before uh, Christmas break. It has an electroacoustic track to it. The kids loved it. That Yeah, that one is very popular. Um, another one that is unique is Steve Danu's Hypernova Rising. It is a 0.5 and a grade one, all in one. You can play the 0.5, you can play the grade one, or you can play both of them together. Um, that's great for uh, programs that you have to mix beginners and non-beginners together. So that's very helpful. The one that's really unique is Alex Shapiro's Count to Ten. Um, that, that has maybe just a couple more notes out of the range, but it gets the kids counting. The kids are actually counting. They count up, well, they count to nine. You can talk to Alex about that, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great, and that has an electroacoustic track. That's, that's the top selling piece with Murphy music press right now in the series. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah, it's Alex a, is well established and people know her name and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, but it's a, it's a really novel piece. It's really creative. I thought, wow, that's, that's so creative. I would have never thought of something like that. And so the kids really enjoy that one too. So there, I mean, there's, there are several, there are so many in there actually that are just really well done. Excellent. So that's a good list. I guess what I want to ask Mary is about, um, kind of being a beginning band director and sort of how you're viewed in the profession and like you're the president of the South Dakota band masters, you know, that to me, looking at your career requires a lot of persistence and patience on your part because often beginning band teachers aren't getting the glory, if you know what I mean. And yes, I, I kind totally of want to talk what about that because you've committed to this as your career. And so I'm wondering if you can kind of address that sort of subtext a little bit. Well, I think, you know, and that kind of evolved over time, I would say. Uh, when I first actually came to Brookings, I traveled between three buildings, three K-5 buildings, and uh, taught in less than ideal situations, you know, underneath the bleachers in a locker room, the janitor's closet, you name it. Um, and then probably 10 years in, uh, they started having a vision of having uh, all the grades at four or five in one building, a center, so that the teachers then could teach to their passion. And so probably 10 years in, that vision started. And then so then came about Camelot Intermediate. So all of the fourth and fifth graders in Brookings are housed in one building. And by having that, um, then that kind of changed my focus because I had done some community assistant band things and I, I had done that, but now my focus kind of had changed to where I can really focus in on this. And then um, in our South Dakota Bandmasters organization, 
a lot of our board typically were high school band directors. And, you know, I started voicing my opinion that, well, we need somebody here that represents the five through eight because we're not being represented here. And sometimes, you know, our the sessions at our various clinics or conferences don't represent all of us. Um, and so I think that's kind of how it evolved. And, you know, and I've just, I've done it. I've been here a long time. Before I was president elect, I was actually the representative of young bands in South Dakota Bandmasters. So I've actually been on the board for quite a while. And I think that's just, um, that has taken time. And I assume for some people, I probably, because I don't teach high school, the same respect thing you were talking about, I probably you know, um, but I, but yeah, I under, completely understand what you're saying. I don't teach high school. You know, what does she know? Well, you know, I, I, I know quite a bit and I actually, I know quite a bit about high school. I did high school marching band for a long time. So, and I think the the general population band population in, in South Dakota knows that of me. Um, but yeah, you, you don't, there isn't the glory. Um, and it's, because it, it's hard. It's it's hard to nail down all of those things that you need to know to really get kids started correctly on an instrument. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's how it, it just evolved over time. So as far as South Dakota goes, I'm kind of curious. Um, you're my first guest from South Dakota. And I'm it's, honored. It's a small state in population, but a large state in area. So yes. does it feel like a close knit community or does it feel far flung? How does it how does that feel? No, I would say the, the band director community in South Dakota is very, very tight knit. Um, yeah, I, I would you know we we have our we had just had our conference in February and um, it's a great group of people that, that get along well. And yes. I don't think you'd probably really realize, you know, the distance that, you know, from end to end of our state. But I think it that doesn't seem to matter. And of course, once COVID hit, you know, and then we had the Zoom thing, and then that made that part of it easier to communicate with each other as well. But um, no, I th I'd say we were we are a tight tight knit community, willing very willing to help each other out. Hi everyone. My name is Lisa Tatum, and I'm the host of ICTUS, The Evolving Conductor, a proud member of the Muted Podcast Network. ICTUS is your source for any and everything conducting, listening, teaching, and music making. Treat yourself to a dose of musical inspiration as we pick the minds of great conductors and delve into noteworthy repertoire. If you're a musician, teacher, or conductor, you found your people. New episodes are released on Thursdays, and you can find Ictus anywhere you listen to podcasts or ictuspodcast.com. That's I C the letter two U S podcast.com. Mary, we should do our final questions. This is okay. what I call the enlightened round because there's nothing fast about it. Um, okay. These are big questions. Answer them within your perspective on the band okay. world and your own experiences. And the first one's a big one. And it's where do you draw the line between healthy and, un and unhealthy competition in music? Um, well, I th there is a place, I, th I believe, for friendly competition. Um, is within a section or within a, a band um, where I think it does become unhealthy is when that that is your end goal as a group that you have to you have to place you have to get a trophy in some competition that you're going to um, and I think especially now after COVID we should just be grateful that we're all together and that our groups are together and that our groups can travel other places and be with other groups and, and hear and see them. And I think right now that's what we really need to focus on is just the, the fact that we are together again. And so I, you know, I th and I think if you have the worth work ethic and you have the high standards, um, the results will fall as they may, but that's, that's not the end goal of, in my opinion, of 
of why why anybody should be in band. It might be it might be a good tag along, but that's not the reason why you're in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. People who listen to this show know that I'm fairly negative on competition in general. I mean, I, I do absolutely see value in it. And I know, especially at sure. the high school level, it can really bring programs together. I, I get that. Absolutely. I was there. I taught that. Um, but it's so funny the way attitudes are shifting because my fifth graders today, I have a, I had a heterogeneous class today. And so I had the woodwinds on one side, the brass on the other. And so I had them the woodwinds play the line and then I had the brass play the line and I asked the two percussionists which one they thought did it better. And one of my woodwind players goes, we don't do competition. And I was like, Oh, I was like, but we're trying to get better and it's still okay to try to get better. It was a really interesting moment with the kids. Oh, that is interesting. And I, I wasn't, I was a little taken aback because yes, it's, she's right, but she's also not right. It's just kind of like, I don't know. Uh, it's just, it was a, an anecdotal moment. <laughs> well, that is interesting though. That a fifth grader would say that. Yeah. Good well, for her. It's a little bit of the school ethos too. So, but, um, you know, at the same time as band teachers, we know that there is a need to have a standard of excellence and to hold the students to a higher standard. Absolutely. And inherent in that is, a challenge to the students. Right. Which sometimes they don't get in other places. I'll just pull back one of my interviews with one of my favorite interviews ever was with Gail Buckman, sister Gail Buckman. She's a teacher here in St. Louis. I think she's teaching her 53rd or 54th year now at the same Good for school. Her. <laughs> <laughs> and sister Gail is one of these old school teachers. You know, like when you walk into her band room, the kids don't turn around when they hear the door until she tells them to turn around. You know, one of those, (laughs) she's amazing. And she told me that, um, what she likes about being a band teacher is that she's the only teacher left who, when she gives the kids work to take home, their parents can't do that for them. Like, you know, she's in a very unique situation as the band teacher. And I've really embraced that idea that I'm doing something different than everyone else. I agree. And this, this is a gift you've been given to the students. This is a gift you have now that you can go out and share. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, not a lot of other, you know, disciplines can say that. That's true. That's true. So this is a question that many directors struggle with young, old, mid mid career. And that's how do you find a work-life balance? Um, I'd say my husband and I would say we, probably haven't done a good job with that. Um, we both, you know, are, are, we work a lot. Um, but we do also at the end of every single day, we sit down and we talk about the day. And a lot of times we both say, Oh, I was so looking forward to 8 PM tonight. And so, you know, we always have at least that one time during the day that we are able to you know, relax and talk to each other about our days and vent. And, and then we, you know, we really try to also protect our weekend times. And obviously sometimes you you have commitments, but um, we really try to protect that to try and keep as even a balance as possible. All right, Mary, this is a big one. And aside from COVID, which we we know, um, what are the big challenges facing music, music education, and how do we best meet them? Um, well, I think we, we touched a little bit on it. I think, first of all, just going back to the beginning band music, I think we need to get more composers writing for that younger age, um, more variety, more variety of composers um, to give our students a, a, just a different viewpoint. Um, a lot, a lot right now is, are you playing music that reflects your students? Well, for me, most of my students are Caucasian. So I have the obligation to play perhaps music from a non-Caucasian and just what different viewpoint they have from their community or their race, or um, it's just a different viewpoint because not every single student is going to live in South Dakota forever. 
So it's something, you know, to look for them to look towards. Um, so I think that's the first challenge and just to get composers on board. And then I think the other is keeping, retaining band directors, young band directors. Oh, gosh, yes, that's a huge problem. I mean, I believe I mentioned it earlier, but the number of openings that we've had in South Dakota last year and it started this year, it's, I mean, it's scary. And how do we help them best? And then the other thing associated with that, I believe, is also how do we best help them with their mental health? Yeah, yeah. It, you, you read that, that college students, even more so now after COVID, are more depressed, more anxious. Well, that carries over, obviously, into first-year teachers. And so then now what tools do we have to help them with that as well? The fourth graders at my school um, were put in one class this year. It's a small class, but it's like 20. Um, usually it's like two classes of 15 per grade at my school. That's kind of our size. But they've had four teachers. And one just left a couple weeks ago. And I was, and the, the principal, the head of the school, didn't tell anyone until that afternoon. But I got wind of it because I was walking out. I, I was leaving a little early to get my kids. And I was walking out, and a fourth grader is coming down the hallway, like tears streaming down his face. Why do they keep quitting on me? You know, it's like, oh, wow. it's not great for the kids. No. And I don't, I mean, this is a podcast for teachers. So, I mean, we all know where a lot of this is coming from. I don't want to make this political or about a certain, you know, anything right, like no. that. But we are, I feel like the profession is under attack. And I feel it. And I'm, 27 years into this gig. Right. Um, teachers are just leaving. It's not a great situation. We have to fundamentally change the way this profession is viewed. And frankly, nurses and social workers and everyone else yeah. who does something that's anything that's a calling right now is getting taken advantage of. Correct. Yeah. And so it, Part of me is kind of hoping that we have enough teachers to quit, that we have to have a reckoning. I mean, as terrible as that is to say. It is, because as you say, then that's that's hurting the students the most. Right. But by the same token, we can't go on like this. No, and I agree. And everyone who's it's, listening it's, it's probably tough. agrees with us. I imagine. Yeah, it's it's tough, you know, and like we also talked about, you have these jobs that are K through 12 jobs and... I can't blame them for wanting to leave. Oh, That's yeah. tough. Yeah. Oh, we didn't even touch on that. How do you how do you change gears between teaching steady beat right. riff to high school band? Exactly. Um, it's, or choir. It's I mean, I know people who do choir, band, and general music. Yep. I, I don't have that in me. At least not. I, my I'm age. with you. Um, I mean, well, I said I, I just. <laughs> They are my true heroes, the, pe the yeah. people that do those jobs. Good for them. I could do it, but I won't do it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's that takes huge commitment and, oh, it's, it'd be a tough job. Well, that those are challenges for, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not to sure I answered how best we can meet them. but Yeah, well, these are public policy questions and all we right. can do is advocate continue to do the things that we do in our organizations support our professional organizations be members of your state yes. bandmasters be members of your Correct. state mea this yep. is how we get change to happen through advocacy right. and national organizations this goes back to the first founding of these back in the 1800s um, right so that's how we got banned in schools, by the way, everybody. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> All right. So, Mary, this is my favorite question. If I had a time machine um, and I could take you back to the afternoon of your high school graduation, what advice would you offer to your 18-year-old self? I guess I would say just looking at my, my college career, uh, if, if you're going into music education, take those pedagogy classes really seriously. I wish I would have taken that more seriously. And 
I, and I tell this, I have a lot of student teachers and a lot of people that come out and observe me, get out and observe everything, everything. It doesn't matter the level, uh, just get out and observe and just see all sorts of different levels, all sorts of uh, district sizes, school sizes, class sizes. I just think that's, you can just learn so much from just observing, you know, 30 minutes here and there. It, you would be amazed how much you would learn. I highly would have done that more. I would have loved to have done that more had I known. All right, Mary. Um, so I asked this next question as a way of kind of not asking for your favorite piece, but perhaps one that has great value to you beyond just being something that you love. And that's, um, if you had a choice, what would be the final work that you would conduct, listen to perform? Um, if you had that choice, if you could control that. Well, since I primarily do beginning band, anything that's has something other than four, four in it would be <laughs> terrific. Um, but, uh, Seriously, I would say, especially since I got into the beginning band adaptable series and being more aware of conductors and composers, um, there is so much new music out there that is just awesome. And so I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not sure that the piece that I would want to listen to, or I'm not sure it's been composed yet. I don't know. Okay, that's interesting. How about one that has been composed? Do you have one? Oh, <laughs> that's a that's a tough one. I know. I um, can't force the issue here, Mary. Yeah, no, I, there there are just so many. Um, you know, Elsa's procession to the cathedral, Lincolnshire Posey. Um, there, there, there's just Persichetti's. Uh, there's so many. So many that, um, but yeah, I just, I would love to actually conduct some of these new pieces that are out there that are just yeah, phenomenal. Fun. It'd be fun. Yeah. I miss that. I haven't had an opportunity to conduct a high school group. I conducted a little few of the college groups when I taught college, but I haven't had an opportunity to go back and do that again in a while. And I wouldn't mind um, doing a big piece again that I have to really work at. You know, yeah, you have to really think about. Yeah, I mean, score I, study. I do score study of the beginning pieces. I need to know how to take them apart and teach them, but it doesn't take very long. It's no, you know, it's, <laughs> it's usually it's usually like forty five minutes at the kitchen table, kind right? Of, kind of job. So, all right. Um, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Um, just a continue support of the beginning band adaptable series. Um, please, you know, look at the website and, um, with your support by purchasing, you know, the, and, and give the opportunity to your, to your students, give those unique tune opportunities that have the electroacoustic track, which the kids love and the supplemental material, um, just to keep promoting that. And, and I would just say, I, you just mentioned it just a little bit ago, to get involved with your state associations. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what I really want to support I, and, and get involved as a mentor. You know, a, men, a first year teacher needs a mentor. Well, we need the people to be mentors. So reach out to whatever organization. I know National Band Association has a mentoring program too. So reach out and, and try and help us out and try and to retain these, these young teachers. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're bleeding talent in the profession. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right, Mary, how can people get in touch with you? Um, you can always go to Facebook, uh, Mary Cogswell. I'm sure it comes up pretty readily and otherwise, um, just mary.cogswell at k12.sd.us. You could also just Google it, uh, Mary Cogswell, South Dakota Bandmasters, and that would come up as well. So there are several ways. Mary, this was a really fun conversation for me. I'm, I'm in a little bit different mood than usual because I taught today. <laughs> so I'm a little right. bit more to the point about the experience, but I really appreciate sure. your time. And, um, you know, it was well, this was fun. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, and again, thank you for just providing this for our profession. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm.